The sun beat down on the caravan. It was so hot out of the plains. Even the breeze did nothing to bring relief to the merchant and his crew. Perched atop the center wagon was their guide, their faithful guardian. The ranger's eyes swept across the grass-covered lands. Sweat dripped down his face, but he never blinked. Nothing would break his focus. For years, he had served the merchant as its protector. Usually, it was the easy job imaginable. Just sit up here and watch. But every now and then, things would go sideways. Raiders would show up, and then they'd have a hard-fought fight ahead of them. That's what happens when you walk into a trap. His eyes shifted to the other side of the caravan. More waves of grass. They were dry and brittle. One spark would all turn into an inferno. No fire magic, that was for sure. You didn't want to be caught in the middle of a wildfire. It was bad enough roasting in the sun. That was still better than being burnt alive. Dust rose up behind them. While silent, any beginner scout might as well have been a fireworks show telling the bats right where they were. Please, gods, let it rain, he prayed. Being cold and wet was so much better than announcing your presence to anyone on the plains. The rest of the crew would probably disagree, but hey, they weren't out here. The mages were all sitting comfortably in the different wagons, conserving their strength. Those bookworms would do well to put on a little muscle and endurance on their bones. I'd save them the next fight. Riding alongside the wagons was the cavalry troops, a dozen horsemen, each with a bow, a spear, and a sword. Patrolling from the front to back of the caravan was their leader, a man that looked more like a scarred tree trunk than a man. His back was straight after hours of horseback riding. He'd been at this game as long as the ranger. They couldn't count how many close calls they had to survive together. Dust rose on a ridge ahead of the party. The ranger looked ahead as he raised his hand. Coming around, the captain looked up at his comrade, waiting on bated breath. What was happening? Reaching under his cloak, the ranger produced a small breath telescope. Its surface was discolored from the sweat of many uses, but its lenses worked fine. Why well, replace something just because it wasn't as pretty as it used to be? Far ahead were several figures. Each was as tall as a man on horseback. But these weren't riders. Not a chance. Each was only one creature, both rider and mounted one. Centaurs. Ranger pulled his bow out and notched an arrow. The centaurs were fast, but it would still take them some time to reach the caravan. Plenty of time to get into formation. What were they going to do? They weren't here the last time the caravan came through. No, they must have wandered in after last moon. Through the telescope, the ranger judged them. They were covered in body paint and carried a bow and spear each across their extended backs. Long black hair danced in the breeze. They shifted about nervously. Were they getting ready to battle or just protecting themselves? The captain looked up at the ranger waiting for his decision. Hello and welcome back to Mythical Phylogy. I'm Jason Diargos. Come and sit for a spell and let's see what we can learn about these interesting creatures. Centaurs have a human torso growing from the horse's shoulders. This leaves the centaur with a total of six limbs, two arms and four legs. This will require a more complicated and larger brain to accommodate with the larger build. That would be an easy adjustment. However, this means that the centaur will need to increase their food intake compared to that of a horse or a human. Brains are one of the most energy demanding organs in the body. Horses are herbivores while humans are omnivores, with more of a carnivore design. To figure out the diet, you'll need to discern how their organs are set up first. You cannot just simply join two creatures together and call it a day. No, if you did that, you would have a redundant respiratory and digestive system, and that would create issues. Disruptions in how the organs work, circumvalization of the hearts, etc, etc. That's why you don't see creatures with redundant organs. At most, you have two, left and right symmetry. So how does the organs line up? Tell me. Why do you think every terrestrial species on Earth has their lungs close to the head and digestive organs behind? Well, the brain needs about 20% of the body's entire blood and oxygen flow, yet only comprises 2-5% to of the body's mass. That's rather impressive, isn't it? That would put excessive strain if the brain and heart were further apart. There is a second issue, air intake. You want the lungs as close to the mouth and nose as possible for breathing. What does this mean for our centaurs? Well, we can spread out the two systems, respiratory and digestion. The human torso can house the entire respiratory system. 
You will need to extend the rib cage to the human pelvis horse shoulder combo to allow for the expansion and contraction of the lungs. If you don't, the air intake would be dramatically reduced. You also need to enlarge the heart a few sizes. This leaves the lower horse torso to fill the digestive system. The whole thing would house the stomach and intestines. Horses don't have a rumen or multiple stomachs like cattle. A rumen is used for the fermentation of vegetables, but a horse does not have this in their digestive system. Why am I even bringing this up after all? Well, remember what I said about the brain and its energy consumption? By adding an extended digestive system, the horse would be able to extract a larger amount of nutrients from their food. You could also increase the room of the digestive tract to house the additional stomachs. In order to facilitate the skeleton, you'll need to thicken the spine through the human body. Note that this will reduce the flexibility. Okay, now our center can breathe and digest. But there is another question to look at. I'm sure some will give me some strange looks and comments, but we need to talk about the centaur's development. A newborn horse can walk within two hours, so long as it has nursed enough immediately after birth. But a human? <laughs> You're looking at your best. They can't even hold their heads up for a few months. So what's going to happen to the center after birth? Will the horse's legs start walking and the human torso flop about? Nah, that would kill the centaur. So we need to find a happy medium for time of birth during development. So what regulates the time of birth? That would be the size of birth canals. The centaur's birth canals are the same as the horse, which requires about 11 months to develop. But a human has 9 or 10 months. That's going to be a problem for the centaur. With the addition of the human torso, the size of the horse is going to increase and force the child to be born early, possibly at 8 months of development. At birth, a centaur wouldn't be able to walk or run. They'd be more akin to a human baby. A less developed body means the brain won't be as capable, and the child will need more time to grow after birth. Time will be in danger and need protection from the rest of the herd. That is the benefit of being a sentient race where others can protect the newborns. Okay, but how will the center nurse? Here is the question I warned you about. The baby won't be able to stand and feed for a long time, which means the mother will need to help. Let's be honest, the center mother might not be able to lift up their baby, which would weigh about 100 pounds. A better option would be to lay down to nurse, and this wouldn't need to happen for months. So which torso should have the breasts? Well, honestly, either would work in theory. There is one that would be better. If we are correct that the newborn centaur isn't able to move much after birth, the mother will need to help their child nurse. Their arms aren't that long, so the breast they would be able to reach is that on the human torso. Of course, much of this could be avoided if we would increase the hip size of the horse torso to allow for a longer gestational period. Finally, centaurs are intelligent. They've got a full range of customs and tradition, but not all tribes and clans are the same. Some will be friendly, and others. Well, I prefer the former. Many are nomadic and will wander far and wide. If you're venturing into the territory where they are known to live, I'd be sure to learn about as many as you could. But oh, intelligent creatures are often just as emotional when act on impulse and fear. Be careful how you approach them. If you desire peace, don't take a threatening position. But don't take a stupid one that would make them you an easy target. A mind on par with that of a human, the speed of a horse. That makes for an interesting foe. So how do you fight that? Well first, what weapons would a centaur use? Can they use a bow? Not as easily as you would think. Humans turn sideways to fire bows, even when mounted. While you can turn your hips on a horseback, the centaurs won't be able to do that as much. But they can fire sideways, but that leaves their widest part of their body as a target but it is possible for them. Now, can you run and shoot a bow? Eh, not as easily or as safely. Least of all when you have four legs. How often do you trip with just two? Much worse if you have four, I'd say. So what about with swords and shields? Due to the centaur's height, they would need longer weapons and larger shields to protect their bodies. They could also use the spears and lances to exploit their high speed. They can charge and drive their weapon through you. But no, their spines won't be as flexible and they may struggle with the impact of the spear. So how do we face down a center? Well, they are fast, but they are slow on the turns. If they charge you, strafe and avoid their attacks, move sideways and then counterattack while they recover. 
due to the location of their arms, their rear is exposed and an easy target. All you'll hit is the digestive organs. That can cause them to pass out pretty quickly. The liver can create a lot of blood loss. If aiming at the chest, use a piercing strike to get between the ribs. Avoiding their attacks will always be the best tactic though. But centaurs are intelligent and can use magic as well. You have to address that section when we look at casters. For right now, just say use counter spells and disruption magic as best you can. Now, if you can set up a trap for them, great. With four legs, they are prone to tripping. Set lines as traps. Take a pitfall if you can. Once down, you can strike. They will be slower to get up. As for magic, what can we do? Range attacks. That will be your best option. Create ice and grease slicks for the centaurs to stumble around on. If not, have your druids create a forest or ravine. Raise up a bunch of boulders. This will slow the centaurs down and take away their speed and make the battle easier for you. If you get them in narrow quarters, use spears and long weapons to stab. Don't try swinging. While an interesting race, combat against them is the same as you would any cavalry unit. I'll flank them and use range attacks. Yet, do you need to fight the centaur? Could you fight with them, alongside them? Tell me. If you were traveling with a hobbit, would you mind carrying them on your back as you cover difficult terrain like swamps and snow? No? Well, some centaurs feel the same way, but some do find that as an insult. With friendlier centaurs, you could ride them into battle like a horse. From there, you could use a bow or spells. You won't be able to fire straight ahead else you'll hurt your comrade, but you can fire from the sides. If you're using melee weapons, your range of motion will be decreased. It would be like fighting in formation with a shield, but be careful. For difficulty, I would give them a 3 out of 10. They are like fighting any other sentient creature, and about on par with yourselves. First off, not all centaurs are hostile. Many are friendly and willing to trade. Their large bodies are ill suited for traversing mines and narrow areas. This leaves metal a hard thing for them to gather and a valuable commodity for trade. But what do they offer? Hunting and farming are their fortes, but they are also good for sewing and making fabrics. If you are fighting, you take the spoils through battle, but that is a one-time deal. Personally, I like to be able to get the reward from many times. Well, would you rather have to pay repeatedly for a prize item a thousand times? I'll get it once for some blood. Me, it may cost me some money, but I'll go for the repeated rewards. The ranger watched the centaurs as they approached. He nodded to the captain. The first order of business was protecting their horses and carriages. It was them? Well, then they weren't very good guards. Several other archers took a post on the carriages. The bow was ready. Meanwhile, the cavalry formed a line in the front, the captain holding the center. Every eye was on him. Just the air filled the ranger's lungs. He'd been through these sort of raids before. Nothing they couldn't handle. He eyed the approaching centaurs. They were picking up speed. Now we know their decision. Spears from both parties glistened in the sunlight as the two forces neared. The ranger was the first to strike. He could clearly hear the centaur's war cry when his first arrow fly. A centaur tumbled and landed on the ground. Those beside it were forced to spring into the air to avoid trampling their kin. At the captain's urge, the riders charged. They didn't want to run into the center of spears, instead they split apart and flanked the centaurs. This exposed the majors behind them. The arrow already well ahead of their spells. The roar like thunder, bulls sprang from the earth like trees. The centaurs slammed into the sudden wall. The momentum and kin would drive them into the unwielding surface. It was time. Archer and mage alike lined up their shots between the stone pillows and fired on the raiders. They neighed and cried as they collapsed to the ground. The rangers sighed a breath of relief. That went easy. A few centaurs broke off from the defeated raid. The cavalry quickly hunted them down. The battle over, the ranger felt it was safe to lower his bow. That was a dreadful mistake. One of the fallen centaurs pulled the last vestiges of its strength together. It no longer had the strength to draw its bow, but could still lift a spear. Fury filled the warrior's eyes, muscles strained as the centaur forced itself up. It barely had the strength to lift its torso, but it was enough to launch the spear towards the ranger. He didn't notice it until it was too late. 
spear struck true. It was carried over the character's rims from the spear's momentum. <laughs> Cough as he landed in the dirt. The last thing he saw was the spear sticking out of his chest, and his eyes went dark. A warmth spread through him, and he opened his eyes. His old friend the captain stared down at him from the side of their priest. Magic rained down from the staff. That was close, he coughed. He jumped, he took the hand off of his foot. Brushing the dust off his gear, he scolded himself for messing up. Oh, well that almost didn't go well. That is the danger of being an adventurer. Even after the fight is over, it isn't over. Always be ready and watchful of your surroundings. Thank you for coming once more, aspiring adventurers. Please return next time, where we'll be facing the foe I promised before. Golem Construct.